en el suelo. Hi, my name is Jeff. I'm a bartender at Dutch Kills in New York City, and today I'm going to show you how to mix every cocktail. And by every cocktail, we mean not every cocktail because that would be insane. Today we're going to focus on classic cocktails. These are the drinks from the 19th and early 20th century that are still popular today. These are the basic tools I use when I'm mixing drinks. Boston Shaker. I use them because it gives me a little bit more control. They're easier to open and you get a frothier drink at the end. Strainers. This is a Hawthorne strainer. This is a julep strainer. This is a fine mesh strainer. You like to use it for straining out finer shards of ice so you get a really nice smooth shaking cocktail at the end. Bar spoon. You need these for stirring your stirred drinks. Also the bar spoon itself is a measurement for small portions. Jiggers. The bartender's measuring cup. This is your muddler, necessary for mashing to get essential oils out or to dissolve uh, sugar into a drink like an old fashioned. I can't stress this enough, good ice is extremely important for making a good cocktail. You can have great quality alcohol, beautiful fresh juices, and then you put a piece of smelly ice from your freezer into a drink and it's just going to taste like your freezer. So what I recommend is to pick up a bag of ice from a grocery store before you're making drinks to make nicer ice in a silicone mold at home. Or if you live in a major city, there's an ice company in most places that'll be happy to furnish you with big dense cubes like this. Old fashioned. To make an old fashioned, we're gonna build it in the glass. First we start with a white sugar cube, three to four good dashes of bitters, just a small drop of soda water to help the bitters and sugar cube dissolve when we muddle it. Whiskey. Could be bourbon or rye. I think the most traditional is bourbon and it's what I'm using for this. Ice. For an old fashioned, I like to use as big of a piece as ice as possible to fit in the glass. Reduce the surface area between the ice and the rest of the drink so we're slowing down the melting of the ice and we can hold on to our drink for longer. And lower that in with the bar spoon so we don't splash everywhere. You don't really want to over stir an old fashioned. And traditionally this gets the rabbit ears garnish, which is a orange and lemon twist. So I like to express all the essential oils out of that twist and crisscross. This is the old fashioned, the classic of classic cocktails. When the word cocktail first came about, it was really just defined as spirit with water, sugar, and bitters. And those are the primary ingredients in the drink. Manhattan. First thing you'll need is a chilled pint glass. Bitters in. One ounce sweet vermouth to two ounces rye whiskey. And as always, we're adding all of our spirits before ice, starting with the least expensive ingredient first. You can use any blunt object to crack ice. I'm using the back of a steel muddler in this case. For great control, you can even just use a tablespoon from your kitchen. And now we stir. This actually will take a second. You can sing a song in your head, something I like to do. And a quick taste and temperature check. It's getting cold. Chilled coupe, again, every ingredient should be as cold as possible to keep your drink as cold as long as possible. This is a Luxardo cherry. Uh, the kind of bright red maraschino cherries you see in a lot of bars were based on this. Really, really tasty. Highly recommend finding them if you can. For stir drinks, I'll use a julep strainer because it fits better into the pint glass. This is a Manhattan. Legend has it, it was developed at the famous Manhattan Club in the 1870s. It's the probably second most uh, popular cocktail right after the old fashioned, still to this day. Whiskey sour. To make a whiskey sour, we need fresh lemon juice. It's probably the single quickest, easiest thing you can do to improve the quality of your drinks is using fresh juice whenever possible. The simple syrup is equal parts uh, regular white sugar and water dissolved, and two ounces of whiskey. So what makes this whiskey sour traditional is the addition of egg white for a foamy top. So for any drink containing an egg white, the first step is a dry shake before we actually get to shaking the drink with ice. This is called a dry shake because it doesn't have any ice in it. This is usually when you talk to your customers and then they tell you their problems. All right. So our first step is complete. You can see the egg white is already nice and frothy. So now we'll add our ice carefully into the shaken drink. Softer shakes. Right now I'm cooling down the temperature in the shaker and it's creating a better seal between the two cans. 
Now that I feel the shaker is cool enough, I can create an airtight seal in the Boston shaker and really go for it. I use a large chilled coop for this. This is the Hawthorne strainer, which fits this kind of shaker best. And as a garnish, do a little decoration with our Angostura bitters. I'm drawing a line through the bitters uh, to make a nice little feathered pattern. And this is your traditional whiskey sour. I love whiskey sours. I also love making them for people that have never tried them before because people aren't always into the idea of egg whites at first. And then when you hand one to them, it, they'll taste that it's just ethereal and fluffy and not eggy at all. Sazerac. Start off with a chilled glass shaker, white sugar cube. We're going to douse this sugar cube with a good amount of Peychaud's bitters, which is the only bitters that makes us a traditional Sazerac. And as we do, whenever we have to dissolve a sugar cube, we add just a little drop of soda water, not a lot. And now we muddle. Don't be afraid to really go for it because you do want your sugar to be dissolved. Take out your aggression. Two ounces of rye and crack away. Spoon all the way to the bottom. So while the Sazerac sits on ice, we're going to give our glass an absinthe rinse. We like to put absinthe into one of these atomizer bottles. So the traditional garnish for Sazerac is a lemon twist. Now some people like to serve the lemon with the drink. Some people just like to express the essential oils from the lemon and discard the lemon. I don't want to make anyone mad, so what we do at the bar is put the lemon twist on the inside of the rim. That way people have the option of kind of having the twist or not. A Sazerac is special because it's one of the first cocktails that used absinthe as a aromatic, just to lend a last bit of almost seasoning to a drink. Whiskey fix. We're gonna start with equal parts fresh lemon juice and simple syrup. Two ounces of whiskey. Bourbon or rye works well for this. I'm using bourbon. We're just going to do what we call a whip on this drink, which is just shaking with a small piece of ice. And with this, we're just trying to lightly chill down the drink, basically until the piece of ice dissolves. Chilled Double Rocks glass. For this, we're gonna use crushed ice, and I recommend going to a fast food restaurant or a fish market and begging them to give you their crushed ice because it's the best for this. Steel straw. I use steel straws because metal straws are good for the environment, but even more so, it's also really good for conducting the cold temperature of the drink. The fix gets two garnishes, a lemon wedge and a Luxardo cherry. And here you are, your classic whiskey fix. A fix is any cocktail that consists of lemon juice, simple syrup, and a spirit. You can also muddle fresh fruit into a fix for seasonality. Who doesn't love seasons? Boulevardier. As always, we're gonna start off with our least expensive ingredients first. We have our sweet vermouth, Campari, which is a must for a Boulevardier, and bourbon. And give this guy a good stir. And we'll take a chilled coupe. A oh, Boulevardier can also be served on the rocks, but straight up is standard. And the traditional garnish, an orange twist. This is one of my favorite cocktails, the Boulevardier, which is often thought of as a cousin to the classic Negroni. So they both share sweet vermouth and Campari as two of the three base ingredients. With a Boulevardier, it's whiskey instead of gin. Presbyterian. So a Presbyterian is my favorite in the category of drinks called a Buck, which is a lime juice, ginger, spirit drink. So a uh, Moscow Mule, a uh, Kentucky Mule, all examples of Bucks. So to start, half ounce of lime juice, fresh. And for maximum ginger flavor, we like to use fresh ginger juice. Presbyterian is made with rye. We're going to whip shake this with a small piece of ice, just to get the base mixture chilled down slightly. I like to add the first bit of soda water into the can. That way we get a slight bit of carbonation that helps mix the soda into the drink as you're pouring it out. And my secret weapon once again, big ice. And top with more soda water. And I like to top these with a little crystallized ginger candy, just so it gives people a little hint of what they're about to drink. This is a Presbyterian, the platonic ideal of a whiskey ginger. 
blinker. Use a half ounce of grenadine for this. Grenadine is probably my favorite cocktail syrup. It's made from a concentrated, fresh pomegranate juice, sweetened with sugar. Adding to that an ounce of fresh squeezed grapefruit juice and two ounces of rye. What I love about the Blinker is that there aren't that many citrusy, refreshing drinks that people think about when they think about rye whiskey, and this is really one of those. One big rock for shaking. Hawthorne strainer. This is the Blinker, a shaken rye cocktail. Originated probably around the mid to late 1940s. Appears in one of the great cocktail books of all time, The Fine Art of Mixing Drinks. Improved whiskey cocktail. Start off with Peychaud's bitters and just a bar spoon of absinthe. A half ounce of Luxardo Maraschino. This was made available in America in the 19th century and became a very popular sweetener as an alternative to sugar, hence the improved whiskey cocktail, as opposed to an old fashioned which just used white sugar. And this drink gets a lot of rye. Big rock. I'm trying to just get a little bit of ice down so that it fits in the tapered bottom of the glass. And just like with the old fashioned, you don't need to over stir this drink. And a nice lemon twist for this guy. This is the improved whiskey cocktail. This whiskey cocktail thinks it's better than other whiskey cocktails and it's right. Monte Carlo. We'll start with Angostura bitters, as so many old fashioned variations do. Instead of sugar, this gets a herbal and slightly sweetened kick from Benedictine liqueur. This is a drink bartenders love to make because it has three ingredients in it, and it's very fast and very good. This is rye whiskey. Big rock in glass, and we'll give this a judicious stir. So the herbal qualities of the Benedictine go really nicely with a lemon twist. One of the most popular riffs on an old fashioned, the delightful Monte Carlo. Named after a brave man named Carlo who climbed a mountain. I'm kidding, it's named after the city of Monte Carlo. Mint julep. First things first, we need a lot of mint for a mint julep. So what I do is use the bottom leaves off of a sprig of mint, save the tops for garnish, and I'm gonna put about maybe 15 or 16 nice fresh mint leaves into the bottom of the glass. So the mint julep gets sweetened with a little bit of sugar to start the abrasion process going to get those mint oils out, and then a little bit of simple syrup to provide the rest of the necessary sweetness. So I'm using the muddler here. I don't want to over muddle the drink either, but just get it crushed up enough. And while I'm doing this, I'm also spreading the mint around the inside of the glass as well. Two and a half ounces of bourbon, if you please. I'm gonna fill this julep tin up about two thirds of the way with crushed ice. So we're gonna swizzle the drink, which is just to lightly combine a drink on crushed ice. It gets that crushed ice a little further down into the glass, making room for more. Add our straw in now, which is much easier than if you do it after all the ice is in there. And we take the prettiest looking mint we have. I like to lightly tap the mint against my hand to just get the aromas coming out of the mint leaves. And give a nice mint flourish. Though I don't know when this uh, tradition began, it is a really nice addition to a mint julep to finish it off with a slight drizzle of Jamaican rum. And there's your mint julep the official cocktail of the Kentucky Derby. Legally speaking, if you say the phrase, I do declare, you're supposed to be holding a mint julep. Martini. Chilled pint glass. More than anything else, you want a cold martini. The standard martini spec is one ounce vermouth to two ounces gin. I'd like to go with a London dry gin. And now we're adding some dense ice all the way up to the top with ice. Chilled coupe glass for our very cold martini. Julep strainer, crystal clear and very cold. There are two common garnishes for a martini. It could either be olives or a lemon twist. This is a gin martini with a twist. Obviously one of the most beloved classic drinks of all time and one of the ones that spawn the most variations. This one is the standard. Martinez. Again in a chilled pint glass. Start off with orange bitters. So traditionally this drink calls for equal parts sweet vermouth and old tom gin. And you'll notice that it is not clear like most gin. That's uh, because either the gin has been aged in a barrel or has had malt added to it. And to that, some nice cracked ice. There are fights over how to garnish this drink. In this case, the fight is lemon or orange twist. Go lemon. 
This is the Martinez. It's often thought of as the predecessor to the Martini. Biggest difference between the two is that this is made with sweet vermouth instead of dry vermouth. Gimlet. Gimlets were traditionally made with Rose's lime juice, but we like them with fresh lime juice these days. Three quarter ounces of simple syrup and our standard two ounces of gin. This one has a bit more of a peppery, citrusy finish to it. But we've got our chilled coupe and a nice big rock for shaking. I'll use two strainers, both the Hawthorne strainer and a fine mesh strainer to get those last bits of ice. And that is a gimlet. One of the oldest, simplest, and most refreshing gin cocktails. Gin Ricky. Three very simple, fresh ingredients, just gin, simple syrup, and lime juice. So a Ricky is essentially a gimlet, but with soda added, served on ice. And there's your gin Ricky. It's just a simple, refreshing, fizzy gin cocktail. Negroni. Classic Negroni is just equal parts Sweet vermouth from Turin, if at all possible. London dry gin and Campari. Nice large rock. Orange twist for this guy. That's a Negroni. Classic Italian cocktail. One of the most refreshing things you could possibly drink. Corp Survivor number two. It's an equal parts drink. Equal parts lemon, triple sec, Lille Blanc, and gin. We give our chilled coupe a nice rinse of absinthe and finish that off with a generous lemon twist. This is the Corpse Survivor number two, a classic refreshing gin drink invented by Harry Craddock at the Savoy Hotel in London. Aviation number one. As for why it's the number one, there's also a number two, which doesn't contain the trademark ingredient of creme de violette. Creme de violette is a liqueur made from the violet flower, but it isn't always available, and when it became scarce, the number two was invented. Gin, echoing the presence of maraschino liqueur in the drink, we're also adding a cherry to the bottom. The weird and wonderful aviation number one. If you ever see creme de violette in someone's bar and wonder what it's used for, this is it. Tom Collins. We use equal parts lemon and sugar, two ounces of our old Tom gin, and we whip a little bit of soda into the can. And the classic garnish is a Luxardo cherry and a beautiful orange wedge. This is a Tom Collins, similar to a Gin Ricky, except this is made with lemon juice instead of lime. Ramos Gin Fizz. For this, our citrus is a split base of lemon juice and lime. And for added complexity, we also use a couple of drops of orange flower water. Simple syrup. So what makes a Ramos Gin Fizz special is the meringue that forms from this drink. And what makes the meringue extra fluffy as opposed to other egg white drinks is the addition of heavy cream. Two ounces of our gin, egg white for a foamy top. And it gets a particularly hard dry shake because we're really starting that meringue right now. I'm gonna be doing this for a while, so let's talk more about the Ramos Gin Fizz. It required so much work that initially this used to be a multi-person operation where one waiter would then hand this drink to another waiter and then hand this drink to another waiter as they were going along. All right, well this is great. We already have the beginning of our meringue forming down here. Now carefully drop our nice big shaking rock. So you can see that our nice meringue is starting to form. We're gonna stick it into the freezer and let that set. And we're back. It's solidified a little bit from uh, sitting in the freezer. If you're a good bartender, you stick your straw in and it should not move. I guess I'm a good bartender. You take the fizziest seltzer you possibly can and pour it down the straw. And that is your Ramos Gin Fizz. Pretty much universally agreed upon as the hardest, most work intensive drink to make from the great city of New Orleans. Bramble. A Bramble is a variation on the fix. So it's a crushed ice drink with lemon and sugar and spirit. And before we add the spirit in so there isn't too much liquid in the glass, we're gonna muddle some berries in there right now. And just try to make sure that you crush each one. Now we can add our two ounce pour of gin. We're gonna give this just a little dry shake to incorporate that gin straight into a chilled Double Rocks glass. So nice. We're gonna fill this up about two thirds of the way with crushed ice so they know what we're drinking. This is a Bramble, a dangerously easy to drink gin number with citrus and fresh fruit. 
20th century. This drink is a weird one and I like it. It has lemon and chocolate in it and it is very good. Trust me. Creme de cacao. If you can spring a few extra dollars for the good stuff on this, it makes a huge difference. And a little goes a long way, you'll have this forever. We're using Coqui Americano, which is a aromatized fortified wine. Yeah, just your classic lemon, wine, chocolate, gin cocktail. But for some reason, it really works. Because we use both creme de cacao and this fortified wine, this gets less than the usual two ounce pour of gin. It only gets one and a half. And with this drink, we also finish it with a lemon twist, although most bars like to express the oils out of this lemon twist and then discard it. This is a 20th century, a uniquely flavored lemony chocolatey gin drink invented in 1930, which is in the 20th century. Bee's Knees. I love the Bee's Knees because it's sweetened with honey instead of sugar, and it actually is the drink I make the most for friends when I'm scrounging around their kitchen looking for ingredients I can use for a cocktail. I use a honey syrup, which is really just honey that's slightly thinned out with a little bit of hot water, making it easier to pour, and two ounces of gin. This is the Bee's Knees. One of the things I love about honey cocktails is that it creates a really nice foam on the top. Last word. So in this case, we're using equal parts fresh lime juice, maraschino liqueur, gin, and green chartreuse, which is very strong stuff. So this drink is one of those bartender drinks that bartenders really love. I think the last word is disgusting. Everybody else loves this drink but me. I'm the crazy one, and it's my job to please. What a great order. Last word. Nice drink. And garnish it with a cherry. The delicious to most people. Last word. Vodka martini. A standard martini always calls for dry vermouth and either gin or vodka. Modern tastes for vodka martinis usually mean as dry as possible. I'm going to go with just a drop, although often it could be none at all. And because the cocktail is usually about three ounces in total, with a vodka martini you'll usually get a slightly heavier pour than the usual two ounces. Of course, the most popular variation of the vodka martini would be the dirty martini, which involves olive brine added into it, which is great if you like seawater. I'm gonna give this guy a good stir. This should really feel pretty much frozen. As with any vodka martini, it could be served with either olives or a lemon twist. This is a vodka martini. I feel like I'm at a business power lunch just looking at it. Moscow Mule. So just like other drinks in the Buck family, I'll have lime juice and our fresh ginger syrup and two ounces of vodka. Normally, this is when you would take out the Moscow Mule mug, but I am going to not use the mug for this because in my mind, it leads to just a kind of diluted drink. So I'm gonna make this the way that I make all my other tall Collins drinks. In a tall glass with a nice big piece of ice so that you can enjoy the thing for a while. Add soda. And that's a Moscow Mule. Bonus, if you float bitters on top of a Moscow Mule, that is now a Headless Horseman. And it is delicious. Vesper. I'm going to go with our Cookie Americano. The original recipe called for a product called Kina Lele, but it's not made anymore. And this is kind of the closest thing that we've got. Vodka and gin. Vesper was James Bond's girlfriend. Spoiler alert, things didn't end well for Vesper. And unlike martinis where there's an option between olives and lemons, there is no debate here. This gets a lemon. This is the Vesper, famously invented by Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond. James Bond got me into bartending, so this drink has a little extra meaning for me. Margarita. Obviously, margarita is one of the most popular cocktails in the world. There are so many different ways that it can be made. It can be shaken, it can be served down on the rocks, straight up. So for me, it's just lime juice, triple sec, and silver tequila, the unaged variety of tequila. And as for glassware, I'm going to rim this glass. One big rock. Margarita is probably one of the most popular drinks in the world. It is the national drink of Mexico. I like mine with rocks and salt. Paloma. 
So this drink is made with tequila and grapefruit soda, but we're gonna do ours with fresh grapefruit and lime juice. So this is my spin on a drink that's usually made with a prepackaged drink. Liquid sugar, two ounces of tequila. Shake that guy on our cracked ice. Add a little soda to that can. I add a tiny bit of salt to the top, which will kind of season that drink. And for a welcome dose of bitterness, a long grapefruit twist. This is a Paloma. Tequila, grapefruit, easy to drink a lot of them. Mexican firing squad special. Equal parts lime and grenadine, and a few healthy dashes of Angostura forms the flavor base for this. Standard two ounces of tequila. This drink has a kind of politically incorrect sounding name, but it was invented in Mexico, so we're going with it. Soda in the can. And an orange twist to run the length of the glass. This is a Mexican firing squad special. Daiquiri. Daiquiri couldn't be simpler. It's just three ingredients. Lime juice, simple syrup, two ounces of white rum. We're gonna double strain this guy for clarity. This is a daiquiri, or a daiquiri natural. Just rum, lime, and sugar. It's pretty much holy to bartenders. Hemingway daiquiri. Out of many daiquiri variations, this is one of the more popular ones. It stood the test of time. It is sweetened with maraschino liqueur and also has the addition of grapefruit juice. This is a Hemingway daiquiri. Hemingway was famous for not liking sugar in his drinks, so this one is named after him for the lack of sugar. Dark and stormy. We're using our standard buck spec of lime juice and fresh ginger syrup. Bermuda rum. This is a Dark and Stormy. I just really like this drink. The Dark and Stormy is the national drink of Bermuda, and it is always made with Gosling's rum. If it ain't Gosling's, it ain't Dark and Stormy. Mai Tai. Here's how you make a Mai Tai. This is Orjat. It's a almond scented syrup used in a variety of tiki drinks. A little goes a long way here. Dry curacao, which is one of many different kinds of orange liqueurs used in classic cocktails. Rum agricole, which is made from fermented cane syrup and has a really nice funkiness to it. And we're just giving this a quick whip. Release those aromas. I like putting that mint right next to the straw so that when you bring it to your mouth, you get the aroma coming right at you. And we finish this off with a drizzle of our strong, funky Jamaican rum. This is a Mai Tai, the sexy granddad of all tiki drinks. Mojito. When making a mojito, we're going to need a lot of fresh mint. We have a nice chunky Demerara sugar cube here. And before we add the spirit, just so there isn't too much liquid in the shaker, we muddle. Two ounces of silver rum. Really not trying to add a lot of froth or anything to the drink right now, just to get it combined. And into a chilled double rocks glass. Crushed ice to top, give our mint a little smack. This is a mojito, the national drink of Cuba. One of the simplest, most delicious drinks there is. Just rum, lime, sugar, and mint. Hotel Nacional Special. Probably my single favorite rum drink, if I had to pick. This is kind of a pineapple version of a daiquiri but instead of using sugar to sweeten, we use apricot brandy. If at all possible, use fresh pineapple juice for this. Last but not least, this gets just a bar spoon of cane syrup. This gives just a hint of depth. And two ounces of aged rum. And to finish, just a dash of Angostura bitters. A little feather across the top. This is a Hotel Nacional special invented at the Hotel Nacional in Cuba. Highly recommend trying this one if you haven't. Sidecar. Another great, simple three ingredient cocktail. Lemon juice, Cointreau, and cognac. For this, we are going to be going with a dry version of the cocktail, the no sugar version. And we will finish this guy off with 
a lemon twist. The Sidecar is an undisputed classic, a wonderful, sharp, citrusy brandy cocktail. French 75. We'll start off with a half ounce each of lemon juice and simple syrup. Technically, a French 75 can be made with gin or cognac, but for today's purposes, we're going with the cognac version. And what makes a French 75 a French 75? Champagne. Yeah. Quick tip, I like to hold on to the metal tree when you're taking this cut off. And last but not least, the lemon twist. This is a French 75, which sounds like a beautiful, elegant name, but is actually named for a military cannon because it feels like you got hit by one when you drink one. Brandy Alexander. You only need three things when making a Brandy Alexander. Brandy, cream, and creme de cacao. This is a Brandy Alexander. Indulgent, decadent, but surprisingly balanced. Just a nice, creamy, delicious brandy drink. Vieux Carré. Start off with a small amount of our monk made Benedictine herbal liqueur. And since the Vieux Carré is a kind of Manhattan variation, it wouldn't be complete without sweet vermouth and bitters, rye whiskey, and of course, cognac. Big piece of ice, finish with a lemon twist or an orange, depending on your bartender. Since I'm here and you're on the other side of the screen and can't say anything, I'm doing lemon. This is a Vieux Carré, another New Orleans classic. Pink Lady. So when making a Pink Lady, we'll start by cracking an egg into our large shaker, apart from everything else we're gonna be mixing. Fresh lemon juice, that nice tart pomegranate grenadine. And as for the hard stuff, the Pink Lady gets a split base of gin and apple brandy, also known as Apple Jack. We'll do our little feathery design. This is a Pink Lady, all too often forgotten, but a true classic. Delmonico. Angostura bitters. Do half ounce each of dry and sweet vermouths. And for the hard stuff, we have a split base of London dry gin and French cognac. All the way up to the top. And the Delmonico cocktail, of course, was invented at Delmonico's, one of the oldest restaurants in the country. Nice swath of lemon. The Delmonico cocktail, New York's finest. Jack Rose. To make a Jack Rose, you just need three things. Fresh lime juice, incredible edible grenadine, and our apple brandy. The Jack Rose, FYI, is the perfect drink for Thanksgiving dinner. Simple, refreshing, tart, delicious. Born in New Jersey. Bonus drink! If you add an absinthe rinse to a Jack Rose, that's a Pan American Clipper. Aperol Spritz. There are a million ways to make an Aperol Spritz, but this is the classic. Two ounces of Aperol. Three ounces of Brut Prosecco, your fizziest seltzer, and the traditional garnish would be just a wedge of orange, an orange twist, just to get a little extra orange flavor into the drink. But then I throw it out and don't tell anybody I did it. The Aperol Spritz. You can do it a million different ways, but this is the classic. Americano. Traditionally built in the glass that it's drunk from. So we're gonna start this on ice, showcasing our vermouth from Turin, just like with the Negroni and Campari. Topping with soda. And this can be garnished with either an orange wedge or a nice orange twist. This is an Americano. It's the predecessor to the Negroni. Champagne cocktail. Heavily douse this white sugar cube in Angostura bitters. In Casablanca, they drink champagne cocktails constantly. If you were to drink a champagne cocktail every time they drink one in Casablanca, you'd be dead. This is a champagne cocktail, which dates back all the way to the mid 19th century. Bamboo. To make a bamboo, we need two kinds of bitters, Angostura and a smaller amount of orange bitters. And for this, we're using equal parts dry vermouth and fino sherry delicious fortified wine. I don't know who made this up, 
But if you're having a little bamboo, like a bamboo shooter, you can call that a bambooter. A delicious low alcohol cocktail dating back to late 19th century Japan. Pisco sour. We use just a split base of the lemon and lime. The reason is simple that in Peru and Chile, the citrus fruit, which they really would just call limon there, has a taste that's kind of right in the middle of the lemons and limes that we get here. Simple serve, pisco, which is technically in the brandy family, but is just really its own thing, and an egg white. Now, traditionally, a pisco sour can be topped with either three dots of Angostura bitters or grated cinnamon. I like to do both, just because I like the flavor that each one of them lends. This is a pisco sour, the national drink of both Chile and Peru. Both countries claim to have created this drink. I choose not to get involved in that fight. Caipirinha. For a caipirinha, we're going to muddle a fresh lime into the drink. In with our lime wedges, we're going to add our friend the sugar cube that we use for most of our muddling applications, as well as some simple syrup. And before we add the base spirit, we'll muddle and two ounces of cachaça. Cachaça is a fermented sugarcane product. And with the caipirinha, we really don't want to overshake the drink. We just need to give it maybe good 10 shakes or so. This is a caipirinha, the national drink of Brazil. It uses fresh lime muddled into the drink, which gives it a really nice zesty flavor. What I love about classic cocktails is the rich tradition and history behind each one of these recipes. Every country has their own spirit that they're proud of, so you can really kind of have a round the world experience when you're trying out classic cocktails. So whether you're trying to mix these cocktails at home or if you're just going to a good cocktail bar, I'd recommend ordering one of these classics. Maybe try one you haven't had before and get into the history of it all. Cheers.